the wise men and the wise women of our people believed that ours was not the only world in which intelligent creatures are to be found. Ours was not the only world in which the song of life is heard. The wise men with the grey beards and the wise women with the grey hair used to say this, and I heard them again and again in my long journey of initiation. It is an insult to believe that God, the great planter of life, only planted life upon this, our shabby little world. No, there are other worlds besides ours. There are other worlds beside our Mother Earth upon which life exists. The Africans even went on to describe 14 of these worlds. And these worlds are very amazing and amusing in the way they are described. It is said that most of these worlds do not have oceans as our earth has got. Some have got huge fresh water lakes which are as big as seas but no oceans. It is said that only two wells are covered with salt water. The first one is the world of the normal, which dances around the star which white people call Sirius. The first encounter between Africans and extraterrestrial beings occurred more than 7,000 years ago in a now forgotten part of Africa. Out of the skies, we are told, there descended a fearsome object a huge spherical object with many things protruding out of it. This spherical object descended to earth with a, a sound like a thousand thunderstorms. And it settled in a valley, we are told. And immediately that valley was mysteriously filled with water. Water cascaded from the slopes of the surrounding mountains. Waters burst forth from rocks where no water had been before. And the water roared down the mountain slopes to fill the valley in which the strange object was. It is said that a number of days went by while the object floated in this new great pool of water. The people were amazed. The people were astonished. The people were afraid. But something kept them coming to that spot until hundreds of them were gathered upon the tops of the surrounding mountains, upon the slopes, behind great rocks and under trees. It is said that a door opened in this strange metallic sphere, and out of the sphere there came a long line of strange creatures, creatures 
that walked like human beings, creatures that had webbed feet and webbed hands, creatures that had the faces of fishes, but the bodies of human beings. It is said that these creatures walked down the gangplank very painfully. Each one of them was carrying a stick at whose top a light shone. Green lights, yellow lights, red lights, and violet lights. It is said that the leader of these amazing scaly creatures wore a crown around its head from which blazed a a stone even brighter than the sun itself. And the leading creature stood on the gangplank while its followers swam in playful circles around the huge spherical craft. The leading creature lifted up its stick and its right hand and it addressed the people as follows. People of this world, we are the Numu people. We come from the land of the star of Kiri Dahu. We come from the star you know as the star of the red dog. Listen to our words because we have been sent by a very high one in a high place to make certain truths known to you. The people listened spellbound as the strange creature spoke. It spoke for days, we are told, telling our people about the mysteries of the cosmos. It spoke for days, we are told, telling our people about the mysteries of creation. The creature told our people that the race of humanity was once great amongst the stars, that human beings were once the leading race in the great cluster of stars. The galaxy. The creature said that because human beings were so vicious, so aggressive towards other intelligent creatures and towards living things in general, a great war broke out amongst the stars as several worlds joined forces against the human race fought it and drove it away from the center of the great star flower to seek refuge in this forgotten world of ours. The Numu or the Numu or the Nomo told our people that there were many races amongst the stars, races of living beings who were afraid of us human beings, who kept us under constant observation to ensure that never again do we become a threat to other intelligent creatures amongst the worlds. The Numu or the Nomo told the people that if we human beings could get rid of hatred, if we could get rid of war, if we could get rid of disease, if we could get rid of selfishness, the great gathering of the star worlds 
would once more receive us with open arms to take once more our rightful place in the great kingdom of the world. The Numu taught us that we must at all times respect the earth upon which we live. The Numu told us that our earth, the earth in which we live, was artificially created in order to breed and to sustain life, life which would then spread to other worlds amongst stars beyond number. The Numu said, Oh, earth-dwelling brothers and sisters, you must understand who you really are. You must understand how great you are. You must understand how great you once were. And you must know that a living thing that does not spread out to the stars sooner or later dies out. And that if you do not follow us into the dark spaces above, you shall exterminate your earth and eventually shall exterminate yourselves. And the, the earth, which is a womb world, a breeder of life, will be once more empty of living things. It is said that after the normal had told our people all these things and many more, it did a strange and frightening thing. It produced a kind of device and it destroyed itself with this device. In other words, it committed suicide. It fell upon the metal gangway and the others came out and cut it up. It was cut into little pieces and these pieces were roasted upon a sacred fire. And a number of people, African people, were chosen to partake of a strange feast in which the dismembered body of the creature was ceremoniously eaten both by Africans and by the other normal. Then the dead normal was replaced by a female normal as the leader of the expedition. And this normal female said that by this gesture do we who come from the star of the red dog seal a pact between ourselves and you human beings. By this gesture do we promise this that if you get rid of war amongst yourselves if you get rid of arrogance and quarrelsomeness, if you banish disease and bid farewell to hunger and poverty, then we, the normal, shall return and we, the normal, shall take you by the hand and lead you, human beings, to the throne of the stars. The normal people were seen once and once only 
and their ships never visited this earth again. We do not know why. Throughout Africa, amongst all tribes, you find this incredible story of how a strange race of lizard-like beings came to us at the dawn of time and gave us knowledge which was astonishing. These beings left this instruction that although the human being is created to look for knowledge in all its forms, the human being must under no circumstances use that knowledge to destroy the earth in which it lives. The Norma told our people that in the past many million years, tens of thousands of worlds have been destroyed in the deeps of space through the aggressiveness, the stupidity, and the rampant ambitions of the races of intelligent creatures that inhabited those worlds. Take care that you do not, in your search for knowledge, destroy the earth which is your mother, said the Nomo. The Nomo's words made a lasting impression upon African people throughout Africa. Africans were not the stupid that some people today believe they were. Our people had knowledge of many things that they are not today given credit for by the world. But they kept that knowledge within very strict restraints. They knew about wheeled vehicles. They knew how to make a wheel. And in the language of all tribes throughout Southern and Central Africa, we have a traditional name for a wheel. In Zulu, it is called Isondo, the rolling bringa nearer, the rolling object that causes another object to come closer. Then why did our people not build wheels? The answer is very simple. They feared that the building of wheeled vehicles might bring about the destruction of the earth. When a Zulu boy was growing up, he had to be an expert with the bow. He had to be able to use the bow and the arrow to survive in the bush. He had to be so good as to be able to bring down a running guinea fowl with one arrow at 20 paces or more. But the great laws of the normal forbade the Zulu people from using bows and arrows in battle, even against an enemy armed with muskets and rifles, as the white settlers were. The laws of the lords of the Red Dog Star forbade us from killing our enemies with impersonal weapons. Our people knew about microscopes. 
This disc here has got tiny holes in it. These holes were filled with fresh water by the wise men who owned this necklace before me. And looking through this hole, when it is filled with water, at an object, the magnification is amazing. Our people could see gems. They could see bacteria. And they gave it a name, and they saw it through microscopes such as this. Now, when Zulus saw gems, they called them Amatriwane, the most ultimate animals, the tiniest living animals. When the Basutu people saw gems through their water drop microscopes, they called them Dinonogana, the tiny creeping tormentors. And when the Shangan people of Mozambique and the Eastern Transvaal saw gems, they called them Nzonganzongana, but they were forbidden by the great laws of the stars from using this knowledge in the same way that Western people have used their knowledge. You had to know certain things. You had to be aware of them. But God have mercy upon you if you tried to build them. Then you were executed by the king without mercy at all. The necklace that I am wearing now, which is known as the smaller necklace of the great mysteries, was made by a Bapedi family in the northern Transvaal just over 500 years ago. And when the blacksmith had finished making this necklace, he and his sons and apprentices were all executed by being flung down a mine shaft to their deaths. Why? Because the secret of shaping verdite, the secret of shaping and drilling through this very hard stone, the secret of engraving the copper here had to die with that blacksmith and never exist on earth again. Today, many nations ridicule the African as a creature which never made any contribution to civilization. That accusation is false, racist, and should be rejected with contempt. Your religion can enable you to reach the stars, but your religion also can act as a powerful chain that restrains your creativity. It was so with us Africans. We were not isolated from the rest of the world. Traders came to Africa in ships and they traversed Africa in land vehicles, in caves in the Sahara Desert are shown paintings of men riding chariots. Wild vehicles were no stranger to us Africans, but we were forbidden by our religion from building them. The people of Africa have been coexisting, really coexisting, with alien beings from the stars for tens of thousands of years.
In South Africa, there is a tribe of people who are known as the Mandebele people. My student Nobela here belongs to this great tribe who are an offshoot of the Zulu people. The Mandebele people pay great honor to this creature, a creature which they say controls the weather of our world. This creature comes from the stars, which the white people call the Orion constellation. And a constellation which we Africans call Ubejana, the rhinoceros. The Mandebele people say that on wells in that constellation dwell these sacred women who are known as the Amakalube or Amakulube. One other people which honors these people from the stars is a very interesting race of people whom you find in the Zambezi Valley. People who are called the Bandwana people. These people are unique in all Africa in this, that whereas each one of them has got five fingers in either hand, they have only got two toes on either foot. Anthropologists call them ostrich people. We call them the children of the rhinoceros stars. These people are one of the tribes in Africa which claim direct descent from star beings who came to earth we know not when and who mated with African women. Star beings which we are told only had two fingers in either hand and two toes in either foot. We are told that the Bantuana people with their two toes on either foot are so because they are directly descended from these long forgotten star beings. The word Kariba is the local corruption of the word Galube or Kulube. And the people of Kariba, the Tonga and the Tonga Ilas, also honor these creatures, the Galube. They believe, like the Mandebele, that these creatures control the Earth's weather. That if the rain falls, it is because they, by some magic means, have turned it on. If there is a drought, it is also believed that the Kalube are responsible. So closely did Africans coexist in many parts of Africa with these creatures that at one time it became a fashion for, for kings and queens in these countries to try and make themselves look as close to the Kalube in appearance as possible. The kings of these peoples used to wear headdresses which were round to give their heads an appearance of being larger than they really were. And they used to, put, to paint their eyes with black paint to make their eyes long and slanted 
and large. And in the land of these peoples, a chin like that, like the, this creature has got, was regarded as an object of beauty. As far up the African map as Nigeria, at one time you found bronze heads from Nigeria portraying living kings, but whose features had been deliberately distorted to make them look as close to the Kalube creature as possible. May I point out another very interesting thing, that in the land of Egypt, at the time of Pharaoh Achen Aten, Egyptians also portrayed themselves to resemble the Kalube people. They portrayed themselves as having long, thin faces, chins exactly like that, and large, shaven heads. In fact, Akhenaten's wife, Nefertiti, wears a headdress which is intended to make her head larger than normal. And in ancient Greece, or rather classical Greece, they emerged a great ruler called Pericles, who also wore a helmet on his head which made his head look abnormally large. And it became a fashion at that time amongst the Greeks to believe that the larger a person's head was, the more intelligent that person was. Our people say that whenever we need the rain, we must direct our prayers towards the Orion constellation. We must at all times keep praying for rain and for a good harvest. Because the moment we stop praying, the sacred Galube women will think that we no longer need rain, that we have reached that stage of our development when we no longer need rain at all and no longer need to, to eat food. Let me end this talk on this subject of the Kalube. That at one time, I and a number of men and women in the land now called Zambia saw one of these sacred creatures. We had been called that there was a strange creature walking around in a certain place near the Kafui River. The creature looked as if it was lost, or rather, it looked as if it was looking for something. And because whenever such an apparition makes itself visible, people immediately call a medicine man or woman or a number of them. We were called there. The creature was tall, just over seven feet high. The creature was definitely feminine. It had a long neck and a very large hairless head. The creature had very long slender arms, but it wore a long robe which hid its legs. 
and it moved with a strange gliding motion across the landscape from one clump of trees to the other one. The creature had a bluish gray skin. It moved through the long grass and then disappeared. After that, we all underwent a ceremony of purification because we had seen one of the holiest beings in Africa. The most hated, most despised, and most feared star creature in all Africa. This is the Mhondo Ruga. This is the creature which our people believe is the very personification of cold-blooded destructiveness and evil. This creature is completely alien. It has no limbs worth noting. It has no legs. It has no features that we can recognize except a pair of fearsome eyes on either side of a, a strange snout. The creature's head is always covered in a metallic helmet and the creature moves along the ground like some kind of slug. It's four part lifted above ground about nine feet above ground and its hind part dragging like a snake behind it. This creature on soft sand leaves a heavy impression which once you have seen it you will never forget it. The creature is very heavy because where it has moved on soft sand it leaves a mark and I've measured it a groove exactly 18 inches deep. This creature is utterly merciless. When a village dogs see this creature they go wild and they try to attack it and it kills them. How it kills them we do not know. But a dog which has been killed by a Mhondoruga does not rot. It becomes hard as if mummified. In fact, it is almost as hard as fiberglass. The dog becomes a hard shell which makes a hollow sound when you strike it with a stick or with your knuckles. In, my, in the course of my career as a Sangoma, I have seen four dogs which the Mhondoruga has killed. The name Mhondoruga means the weaver of war. And whenever this creature is seen anywhere in Southern Africa, our people believe that it is an omen of great war to come. In 1958, I was in the land called Rhodesia. When a great friend of mine, a tribal chief called Rikai Tangwena, called me saying that we should go to the site where Mhondoruga had been seen only a week before. We traveled there, Chief Rikai, myself, two of my friends, and several other people, and we arrived at the place. And 
an amazing sight greeted my eyes. A dog was shown to us, a dog from one of the nearer villa nearby villages. The dog was lying on its side under a tree. The dog was completely hairless. It was dead and its body was as hard as a board. As we moved through the area where the Mohondoruga had been seen, I noticed that all the trees around there as well as the grass were burnt. Leafless skeletons, their branches lifted towards the skies in mute appeal, and that every tree around there had not been bent black, but had been bent white. If you broke one of those trees, you found that the tree had been bent white to a, a distance from the outside, and right at the core of the bent tree was black. Everywhere there was ruin and desolation, and everywhere you could smell a horrible stench, a stench that I cannot describe, a stench that was not of this world, a stench which, once you smell it, you will never forget. A horrible stench that made your, nost your eyes run and your nostrils to be blocked. That was the kind of stench we encountered there. And we scouted around the place and we saw the great trail that the Mhondoruga had left. And we saw depressions in the sand as if some kind of flying object had landed there, leaving four deep round depressions about the size of a, a football in the soft earth. And the people with me, the people of the Mashona as well as Makaranga nations, told me that this meant that a great war was going to break out in Rhodesia, and they were right. Our people were in contact with these extraterrestrial intelligences and what is more that these intelligences which are not i repeat not the figments of somebody's imagination have made a dramatic impact on african culture for hundreds if not thousands of years i have spoken about the sacred creature known as the normal I have spoken about another sacred creature known as the Galube. Now, let me speak about a few more of these remarkable entities from the stars. And I shall choose from this group of little sculptures that I made. I have chosen this fellow here. Now, this creature is the most comical, most amusing and amazing space creature known to us Africans. It is well over 12 feet tall. It is very thin. It has got a pointed head and very 
ridiculous looking features. This creature has been seen all over Africa by thousands of our people and it has been seen by thousands of our people over many, 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 many decades and centuries. The Zulu people used to mistake this creature at first for a ghost and so they called it Munui, which means the dead person. One day, King Shaga, that very aggressive emperor of ours, saw a trio of Munui shadowing him and his army while he was moving south towards the land of the Pondos just beyond the Umzimbubu river. King Shaga immediately ordered a, a, a buto, that is a platoon of warriors, to give the Munuis their marching orders. In true Zulu style, the Zulu warriors charged at the tall entities with guys flashing. The entities paused grew even taller and then turned tail and ran. Now, there is nothing that a Zulu loves more than an enemy who runs away. And the Zulus were very excited. With loud shouts of Mayete, they went after the Munis. As men armed with spears chasing entities from God knows what faraway star. And when the Munui saw that the Zulus were gaining upon them. They stopped with their backs towards the Zulus and through tubes that protrude between their buttocks, they released a horrible stench, a terrible smell that caused the Zulus to faint. Afterwards, these poor Zulu warriors suffered from cracks all over their bodies, on their lips, between their buttocks, on their private parts, and between the toes of their feet, as well as the fingers of their hands. It took a young healer to save these Zulu warriors. And he was the man who fathered my mother. Another name for the moon is Umkungatega, which is a Zulu name for gawking idiot, because that's exactly what these creatures are. They stare at you like idiots, and when you move towards them, they show you a clean pair of heels. This creature is known as Ngadlangad, a name which is imitative of the huge clattering sound which this creature makes when it moves through the bush. This creature is anything from 12 feet high to slightly over that. And it is a metallic creature whose head is covered in a huge bulbous helmet with a transparent face plate of what looks like glass behind which bright red eyes stare at you. This creature is amazing in one respect. Not only is it huge and un indescribably heavy, but its arms grow from the center of its chest. This creature has got one other characteristic. 
it can pass through the mud and the grass fences of African villages like a ghost. It is real, it leaves heavy footprints in the ground, it makes an audible sound, it strangely enough smells of oil or some such chemical. Many Zulus and people of other tribes who have seen the Ngatlangal say that it has a smell like, like a diesel truck. Although no smoke of any kind has been seen to come from it. Nick Chimombe, the man of iron. One other extraterrestrial being that has been seen in Africa hundreds of times. This creature here has the distinction of being worshipped in many African countries as a god, but it is a space-faring entity. It looks for all the world like a cross between a robot and a battle tank. Its head reminds one of the turret of one of the war tanks of the Second World War. And its body is made up of heavy metal with many joints which move with a faint hissing sound. In Nigeria, they call this entity Ogon. In parts of Central Africa, he is called Nguguni, the Lord of the Blacksmiths. And in the land now known as Zimbabwe, Nguguni is worshipped as Chimbi or Chimombe, and his shrine is in the Zambezi Valley. There, in the shrine of Chimombe, you will find black men and women who wear clothes made out of black cloth. And in olden times, these people used to accept gifts of rolls of black cloth from all people who visited the shrine of Chimombe for any reason. If the priests of that shrine do not trust you, they will show you a piece of metal, a twisted rod of metal which has been driven into a piece of wood and they will tell you that this is Shimombe. But if you are a traditional healer, a black medicine man or woman whom they trust absolutely, they will fetch from a secret hiding place in the bush the real object which they are the guardians of. This is a piece of metal about half an inch thick and about the size of both my hands placed this way. The piece of metal, and I speak as a person who does metal work of all kinds, the piece of metal that these priests showed me after I had stayed in the shrine of Chimombe's vicinity for a number of weeks and had earned the trust of the priests is like no metal I've ever seen on earth before. It is, it has a strange soap-like quality. It is silvery red in color if you scratch it. And it is unbelievably heavy. Its structure is very dense, but on several sides, it appears 
to have been fused by great heat and when you ask the priests there what is this piece of metal they will tell you that one day on the southern bank of the Zambezi River a craft from the stars crashed killing all its occupants and that as the craft crashed it exploded and bits of it were flung in all directions. These bits disintegrated and bent away on falling to the ground. But this piece, which they are the guardians of, was catapulted from the explosion and fell into the water on the edge, on the sandy edge of a part of the Zambezi River. And the tribes people of that time, so many hundreds of years ago, recovered this bit of crashed starcraft. And they kept it in a hidden place as a sign to whatever gods may have been inside that craft, that we are keeping your memory alive in our minds. We shall worship you even though you died in an explosion of flame. That is the story of the shrine of Chimombe. Now, I wish you, honorable friends, to meet a very friendly gentleman from beyond. This being is slightly shorter than the average human being. It is completely encased in a metallic suit which is of a golden color or a silvery color. The eyes have a strange slanting characteristic and there is always an odd harmonica-like object stuck to the front of the creature's helmet. There are other attachments too upon the creature's suit. And many people who have been very close up to this creature, people all over Southern Africa, attest to the fact that this creature has only three fingers and a thumb in one hand, not five fingers, as is the case with us. This creature is a thick set, very clumsy looking, and whenever it encounters a human being, like most of these star creatures, it puts some kind of hypnotic spell upon that human being and then very gently it touches the chest of the human being with its hand which it extends exactly as I have done it here. This is the way we are told this creature communicates with human beings. You will often find this strange gentleman messing about with two or three assistants like him in goat pens, cattle pens, and fowl runs. At one time, a Zulu householder <coughs> caught a number of these creatures and sec having enclosed one of his cows in a cage-like structure 
which they were moving backwards and forwards up and down as if taking measurements of the cow for some reason. After that, the Zulu told us that cow of his disappeared while grazing with other cows in the bush about a month after this incident and was never seen again. These creatures are often seen also stealing eggs in African villages. They seem to be very interested in the eggs of domestic fowls. Why this should be so, I do not know. But this is something that I have encountered many times in my career as a Sangoma, that strange humanoid metallic entities with spherical heads are often seen stealing eggs in, in African fowl runs. This creature is known by the Zulus by the comical nickname of Ndeiza, which means Lord Big Round Head. And one tribe in Transkai knows this creature as Mvondini, which means ugly fellow. Now, wait a minute. Many mysteries occur not only in Africa but in other parts of the world and so connect two separate or more continents together. In Australia, Australian Aborigines portray again and again a creature more or less like this, a creature with large friendly eyes no mouth, head and shoulders and legs, and they call it a vongin. And they say, just as we do, that the vongina is a messenger of the gods who comes from the stars. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, 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 
The Zulus say that he who wants to talk about the angry gods must seek the protection of even higher gods. That he who wants to, talk, to backbite a crocodile must ma first make friends with <laughs> an elephant. The thing that I'm holding in my hands here is known as the blade of Shilumi. The hilt is a later edition, but the blade is literally thousands of years old. This thing that I'm holding in my hands has been used in many strange rituals by our people when faced with extraterrestrial intelligences. If a creature from the stars is found dying in the African bush, the law says you must finish it off with this and send its soul off into the great void for reincarnation. One other name for this blade is the blade of Nanana, the warrior goddess who came from the stars at an unbelievably ancient time to fight great battles for African people against demonic entities from the star that white people call Alpha Centauri, which star we call Lito Lapiri, the eye of the hyena or the eye of the wolf. But that is another story. I want to issue the following warnings based firmly upon traditional law. When you see a creature from the stars, you must never show fear. They are not like us. They mistake fear for aggression and they will hurt you or kill you. People in Africa, people overseas, have received bans from these alien beings. Bans inflicted by beings which felt threatened by the actions of the human being consent. Now let me tell you another story and I will cut it as short as possible. There was once a young woman in the land of the Venda people. Her name was Nevulana, which means little rain or rain shower. Nevulana was a widow and her nasty-tempered mother-in-law repeatedly accused Nevulana of having brought about the death of her husband, the old woman's son, through witchcraft. So, very soon, Nevulana found herself an outcast in her village. And she found that she had to do most of the things that she needed for her daily life survival on her own, other women refusing to help her. 
It was the law and the custom in those days that a widowed person was to receive all kinds of assistance. Water was to be fetched for her, wood was to be found for her, and if she had a little child, as Nebulana had a little baby, the baby was looked after for her when she had to go away for any reason. But Nevulana was hated by the community. First of all, because she belonged to the Balemba people and the other people belonged to the Vavenda people. She was a foreigner in her own land, rejected by her own people. One day we see Nevulana walking through the bush all on her own, carrying her baby boy strapped to her back in the African fashion. In one hand Nevulana carries an axe and in the other hand she carries a rope of cowhide. She's going out to gather firewood and she wants to bind the firewood together into a bundle and then place it on her head and carry it back home. It was an ordinary day like many others that she had known. A gentle day, a breezy day, an early spring day. The bush was green and smiling, the grass was tall, and animals were grazing all over the landscape amongst the trees. The smell of undestroyed Africa was all around. The birds were singing. The butterflies were fluttering amongst the wild flowers. We see Nevulan, a short, powerful little woman with a round face, as beautiful as the moon. Her head is shaven because she is a widow. She wears no ornaments on her arms and around her neck and on her legs. She just wears a string skirt through which her powerful thighs reveal themselves again and again as she moves through the bush. Her eyes are large, alert, the eyes of a laughter-loving woman, and there is something enticing about the shape of her rather full lips. Balubedu women are known throughout the land of the vendors for the great beauty of their faces and figures, and Nevulana was no exception. In the far distance, Nevulana saw an old tree, a dry hardwood tree which was slowly dying. She wanted to climb up that tree, chop down some of its branches and tie them together for firewood and take them home. So she saw a rock under a green thorn tree and she removed her baby from her back and spreading the tarry baby carrying skin on top of the rock she laid her little fat son to sleep upon the flat rock and then she strode away towards the old dry tree and very soon she was about to swarm after it like a little ape to cut down the, the branches when a puff adder was in front of her. Its terrible hissing, hissing, sending a sound of menace over a wide area. But Nevulana was a true daughter of Africa. She was not frightened of a snake like a, a puff adder, deadly though this snake is. In her hands, she held her dead husband's battle axe. And with this weapon, she made short work of the puff adder. With one skillful throw, she struck the, the, the snake just behind the head 
completely decapitating the reptile and then without wasting another glance upon the dying monstrosity. She was up the tree and she was hard at work chopping down branches from the dead tree. And then when she found that she had enough wood, she climbed down the tree and started forming it into a bundle, a long bundle which she soon put upon her head with a, a, a coil of, gr of plaited grass as a cushion. We see her coming back from the old tree, moving like a goddess through the long grass. We hear the switch switch of the grass and the song of the birds all around her. She moves. We see the sweat upon her face and upon her breasts. We see the glimmer of sweat upon her shoulders. She walks through the, through the long grass towards her baby. And then, I, what is this? The cry is wrung from her lips and she throws down the bundle of wood and she stares at a strange spectacle that is taking place under the green thorn tree where she had left her baby. Her baby boy is sitting up. All one and a half year mischievous bundle of him. And he is playing, but he is not alone. He is playing with one of the most fearsome creatures that Nevulana had ever seen in all her life. The creature looks like a human being. It has a bluish gray skin. Its head is round like an egg and its eyes are unbelievable. They are large and round, like clay cups out of which old men drink marula beer. They have large split pupils like those of a cat. The creature has got no nose, practically. Its mouth is nothing but a little, a little slit above a pointed chin. The creature has got a thin neck and long thin limbs. It is covered from head up to neck in a material that gleams in the sunlight. And it is wearing footwear of some kind. And it is playing with the little vendor baby. These two very dissimilar creatures are playing with a number of bright stones upon the flat rock and they are as happy as two fishes in the Zambezi river. Nevulana screams with shock. She dashes forward to snatch her baby away from this, this little demon that she sees sitting on, on a pointy backside facing her child. She must get her child away from that thing. And as she moves forward, a hand restrains her. A long bony hand, bluish gray in color, with claw-like nails. A hand whose skin gleams like that of a reptile of some kind a hand covered with tiny, tiny scales like a little fish, a hand whose fingers have more joints than those of normal human beings. Nevulana nearly fainted when this long alien hand was placed upon her shoulders, but she was a true Balubed woman. She overcame her fear and spun around to face a tall creature, certainly a female, with a huge head like that of a large clay pot, smooth and hairless. 
large round eyes, bright yellow with split pupils, stared at Nevula, a mere mockery of a nose with a tiny nostrils, a slit of a mouth in which the vendor woman could read no expression. Who are you? cried Nevula. What are you? Let go of me! A voice spoke in Nevulana's mind. The voice said, My sister, please allow our offsprings to play together. I know that you creatures of this world are dominated by fear, but see your baby and my baby do not fear each other. Please allow children, the children to play. Do not disturb them. Come. The alien creature put a long arm around Nevulana's ample waist and gently but firmly led her away from the two playing children. There, both mothers, an earth woman and an alien from God knows what star, stood watching as the children played. And when the children had played to their satisfaction, when both of them were fast asleep side by side upon the skin spread upon the flat rock, the alien woman moved like a sinuous reptile to claim her baby, her long purple robe swishing through the grass. One long alien leg with two knees and not just one revealed through the slit of the long robe. The woman said, Mother of this world, please now claim your child, but please keep the stones which come from my world with which our children had been playing. And perhaps one day when your people have overcome their fear and distrust, we, the women of Kere Kaure, shall come back to your world and our children shall play in peace with your children. Stay well, said the foreign, the alien woman. She moved through the bush, a tall sinuous form, moving with a strange clumsiness, as if she was not familiar with walking. And soon she had disappeared from view. There is a lot more in the story of Nevulana to tell. But let me tell you simply this. That after this happening, Nevulana took the stones with which her child and the alien child had been playing to the, the, the lord of the nation, the chief. And the chief decreed that this object should be made an object that commemorates the vessel in which the alien woman had arrived on this earth aboard. And inside this box, enshrined for all time, are the stones with which a child of the Venda nation and a child from a distant star played peacefully together in Africa. My friends, this is not a legend. This is a true story. This necklace that I'm wearing here came from the descendants of Nevula. When people started burning elderly people to death in the land of the vendors, 
a wise man fled to my home in Soweto, carrying this necklace and other precious things with him. And he gave me custody of this necklace, saying that if I died without leaving a successor, then this necklace, the necklace of a million years, the necklace of a thousand mysteries, must be buried below my corpse so that no one will dig it out except the gods from the stars to whom it is dedicated. Thank you. I want you, my friends, please, to have a look at this gentleman here. He is one of the well-known star entities, which I forgot to mention earlier in our talk about the many tribes of alien beings that are often seen upon our Earth. What are these creatures doing? Are they visitors? Are they guardians and protectors? Or are they warders looking, overseeing a prison full of criminals? I do not know and I will never claim to know. All I do know is that our people were right when they said that there were many other worlds, they counted 14 of them, that swim like lost fishes in the dark sea of space, worlds in which living entities exist, entities which often visit our Earth, entities of various kinds, ranging from the most grotesque to the most bizarre, from the most beautiful to the most fearsome. This is a very huge creature known by the Zulu people as Isifufufu. This creature looks like a moth or a bat. It is a humanoid creature with arms and legs, but the arms are at the end of very long wings. And this creature is often seen flying across the landscape in places like Transkai and also in places like Natal, in the Natal Midlands. And whoever sees this creature at close quarters is soon stricken blind. A cruel, painful blindness in which the, the eyes run with water and sometimes pass. This creature has got the body of a human being, the face of a strange moth-like creature, and it wears boots, which means that it comes from a civilization where people, if you can call them that, wear footwear of some kind. Impressions of this creature's boots have been seen on the sides of tarred roads in several parts of South Africa in the last 50 years or so. The Isifufufu rarely appears in our country and when it does it always appears just after sunset, never later, and it is seen 
flying like a huge and ugly bird over the beach, over the ocean, and across roads and even above African villages. It has never been known to approach human beings and it has never been known to harm human beings except by the fact that whoever sees it at close quarters gets burned or turned blind. It is a result of this, of what the Sifufufu does, that there grew a belief amongst our people that he who sees God or a God close up will be stricken blind. Now, lastly, let me tell you about another extraterrestrial creature the most well-known creature in South Africa, a creature whose name is almost on everybody's lips in the black communities. That is the Dogoloshe. The Dogoloshe's name, Dogoloshe, means the creature with a bony ridge over its head. Because a Dogoloshe is a short, hairy, humanoid creature with a face that looks like that of a very nasty tempered teddy bear. Its eyes are a fiery red and it has got very long ears pointed like those of a caracal wild cat and running from the Togoloshe's forehead above its eyes right over its head to the nape of its neck is a sharp bony reach, which it is said will cause the death of anyone touching it. The Togolosh is extremely aggressive. It loves to waylay and beat up men who walk about at night. And it loves to use the man's own walking stick to beat the stuffing out of him. The Togolosh loves children. It reveals itself to children and is often found playing with them. But that is as far as the Togolosh's good behavior goes because it loves nothing more than to sexually assault and even to rape women. Throughout Southern Africa, in urban as well as rural areas, our people raise their beds almost three feet high above the ground on bricks and on paint tins filled with earth. The reason for this is to avoid being molested by a togolosh, to protect the sleeper from mischief done by the Togolosh. Though why any self-respecting Togolosh would fail to get at its victim on a bed, I do not know. But what is interesting is this. Belief in the Togolosh extends throughout Southern Africa and also to the Pacific Islands, where in olden days you found Polynesians building their huts on stilts as high as Africans lift their beds on bricks and on tins. And when you asked the Polynesians, why did your ancestors build such houses? They tell you that they are protecting themselves from a hairy animal which is very aggressive. And when a Polynesian described to me what the creature was that they feared so much. His description was word for word the description of a Togolosh. Question, why should people separated by thousands of miles 
across the wide belly of the world believe in the same creature? Answer, because the creature exists, that's why. It's not a figment of someone's imagination. Thank you very much. Our people say that tokoloshis are in themselves not mischievous, but they become evil, especially when they get under the influence of a, a sorcerer who then uses them to terrorize people. And in, my, in the course of my career as a Sangoma, I have met many people, some of them sporting severe injuries, who said that they had been injured by a togolosh. And sometimes this injuring by this creature had occurred in front of many witnesses. A person who has been molested by a togolosh becomes completely mad for about a year or so, and then the madness disappears. Many times, more times than I care to number, in the course of my career as a healer, as a Sanusi and a Sangoma, I have encountered many men and women, some of them sporting quite severe injuries, who had been injured by the entity that we call the Togolosh. The Togolosh always appears after a Sipuputega craft, which white people call a flying saucer, has been seen in the skies above the community. Togolosh is always turn up then in all their aggressive glory. And at certain times, a Togolosh will go out of its way to inflict injury upon children, especially children who have reached or about to reach puberty. A togolosh will terrorize a whole a boarding school full of girls or boys, scratching their backs, inflicting injuries upon the children on their thighs, on their backs, and on their faces and stomachs, injuries that look for all the world as if the children had been scratched by a very aggressive cat. Usually, the scratches show that the creature which inflicted them had three fingers on its hand. And when we were young as children, we were often scratched this way, on our heads, tufts of our hair torn off, leaving bald spots, and our bodies itching all over from mysterious scratches which needed urgent herbal treatment to cure, otherwise they turned very, very deadly, septic and deadly. I remember in the year 1946, a community of black people was terrorized by an entity which was known as Mapunapuna, the naked one. Mapunapuna was a togolosh with a huge round head and an, an, an enormous penis. And he made himself visible to women and to girls scaring the wits out of them, happy to see them run. What happened to Mapuna Puna and where it went, I shall never know. But very recently in South Africa, another extraterrestrial entity known as Pinky Pinky had put in an appearance. And these entities always put up an appearance at certain times when dramatic events are about to take place in the country. I do know from experience that whenever there is 
there are several sightings of a dogolosh. There is always trouble of some kind in the offing. There was a wretch of dogolosh sightings and terrorization just before the Second World War. There was another just before the Devon riots of 1949. And there was another rush of such happenings before the tragic events of Sharpville in March 1960. And let me tell you this, that just before the Soweto riots of 1976, two Mohondoruga creatures were seen moving through the long grass on the edge of Zola Township, which is part of the great Soweto town, uh, Township complex. This, these creatures were seen by over 20 people, some of them residents of the township and some of them mere passers-by. And they were seen in broad daylight in the late afternoon just before sunset. And the sighting lasted almost the greater part of an hour. Not long thereafter, a group of faith healers went to the spot where the creatures had been seen and tried to exorcise whatever negative energy they had left there. And a very amazing thing happened. The moment the people stepped onto that place, they went crazy. They started behaving in an illogical and totally insane way. Men removed their trousers and started dancing in, in, in the felt. Women screamed and went into hysterical fits, some of them utterly catatonic. It was a really amazing spectacle. But it wasn't just the human beings who were affected. A small dog which had followed a group of children to the place also started behaving strangely. It turned upon its owners and chased the legs off them across the felt before it come down. When you are a Sangom, your life ceases to be your own. When you are a Sangoma, you stop becoming an ordinary human being, but you become rather a lonely pilgrim traveling that strange gray road between the known and the little known, between the visible and the invisible, between the mysterious and the crushingly ordinary. And when I became a Sangoma, I started walking along this road. When you are a Sangoma, you do not look for trouble. No self-respecting Sangoma ever does. But trouble finds you. People come to your doorstep, bringing ordinary complaints with which you can deal. But they also sometimes bring strange mysteries to the doorstep of your life. Mysteries that change your life forever. I remember my first case, which was to be one of several hundred to date of the first person who was brought to me with an incredible story to tell. The person had been a schoolboy called Sipo. Sipo told us that he had been captured by strange creatures whom he called dolls. And these dolls had brought him to a strange place, 
and had done strange things to him that had made him almost mad with terror and fear. And to support his story, Sipo showed us two strange injuries on his buttocks. These injuries were depressions in the young boy's flesh, as if flesh had been mysteriously sucked out by some means, leaving the skin intact but caved in to form a depression. I remember studying Sipo's injuries with great amazement. I had never seen anything like this in my life before. But I was to see many more in years to come. People who told a strange story of how they had been taken by strange creatures and cruelly tortured and molested and then returned back to their homes as if nothing had happened. Some of these people had been kidnapped while going to work. Some of them had been kidnapped after many a drunken binge in a neighboring village or homestead. Some of these people had been abducted while carrying on with their daily duties in the felt. I remember a woman who had lost her job with a farmer <coughs> who employed her because she had suddenly disappeared from the labor gang while they were out in the orchard reaping oranges not far from the town of Zebediela in the Eastern Transvaal. The woman had disappeared for a number of days and she returned with an unbelievable story to tell. She returned with her sanity almost lost and with a number of injuries identical to Sipo's in the various parts of her body. And furthermore, this poor woman complained that she had been raped. And to support her story, when I asked a female Sangoma to examine her, the Sangoma found that the woman's female organ inside had been severely lacerated, as if some kind of instrument had been used on her. This woman also suffered from nose bleeding in one nostril only, and she was indeed in need of urgent help. And I thank God that I was able to help this woman and others who had come before and those who were to come after her. But I was always wondering exactly what it is that happens to these people and why it happens to them. I remember when the number of cases I had dealt with reached close to 50, I began wondering what's going on in this world. But I did not have to wonder long. I went to Rhodesia, as it was then called, in the year of our Lord, 1958, I stayed there until the end of 1959. And early in 1959, I went with a relative of mine, relative because his brother had married my sister. We went to the Inyangani Mountains, a range of mountains to the east of Rhodesia. 
These mountains are very ordinary mountains. But there is a brooding menace about them at certain times of the day. They are mediocre mountains, not as majestic as some of the great mountains I've seen in Africa in the course of my many travels. One day, I was with a relative of mine and he told me that we must climb higher up the mountain slope to search for the herb for which our, our teacher, whose apprentices we were, had told us to find on the slopes of these mountains. I refused to go higher up the mountain because I was already suffering from a chest condition that made me lose my breath every time I tried to negotiate a mountain slope. So I stayed in, on the ground and I went into dense bush in search of this herb. I saw a clump of this herb not far away and I made a beeline towards it, I never reached it. A strange blue mist fell all around me. It was like a blue haze, a bright blue haze that seemed to fill the whole land all around me. For a few amazed moments, I looked at the landscape through this strange shimmering blue haze. And what happened afterwards, I do not know. I regained consciousness to find myself lying upon what looked like a metal working table, a smooth table of grayish silvery metal of the type that engineers and metal workers work upon. But this table was like no table I'd ever seen before. It was more like a counter, such as one would find in a supermarket. But it was of solid metal through and through. I was lying on top of this thing and I was naked. And the fact dully registered in my mind. It was as if I was under the influence of some kind of drug or spell, in that I observed all these things with a strange detachment. I was just lying there on the table, not moving a muscle. I was on my back. And then all around me was this strange haze a turquoise blue haze or a curtain of transparent turquoise blue material. I do not know. And beyond this haze, I dimly saw that I was inside a room that looked like a railway tunnel, a small half round room which curved away towards an unseen corner. This room was so small and so low that although I am a short person, my head would have reached almost to the roof of this very confined space. And then, through that strange haze, I noticed many designs made in black upon certain parts of this room, if I may call it that. I even saw a door partly hidden by the curvature of the place in which we were.
I was. And there was something on that door, decorations or writing done in black against the silvery metal. And then, through the haze, I saw things moving. They looked like dolls. They looked so incredible that I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My mind faintly registered the, the spectacle. I wasn't even scared, just mildly surprised and stupefied. These things were moving towards me. There were five of them. And before I knew what was happening, one of them, the tallest and the largest by far, was very, very close to me. In fact, the damn thing, please forgive my weight, was standing less than eight inches away from me. It was short. It had a very large, round, hairless head. It had long black eyes, jet black eyes. It had small nostrils, no ears, and a slit of a mouth. Its neck was long, almost shaped like that of a crane. And the creature wore a garment which covered it from the soles of its feet right up to its neck. The garment reached up to its, the creature's wrists. Its hands were bare. The creature came towards me. And for a few moments, we stared at each other. And I was conscious of a strange revolting smell that emanated from the creature, a smell that somehow chilled the blood in my bones. I wanted to move, to run away, but, but my, my body would not obey the commandments or the commands of my mind. This creature was something to be feared, I sensed. There was something cold and unbelievably unfriendly in the creature's expression. It was a living thing, of that there wasn't the slightest doubt. It was human-shaped, but its face was utterly alien. For a, a moment we looked into each other's face, the creature and I, and then I noticed something. That the long black uh, gog-like uh, things that seemed to cover the creature's eyes were really a kind of, of goggle. And behind the goggles, one could make out the creature's eyes, split pupilled and round. And I wasn't given enough time to dwell upon what I was seeing. As the other creatures came all around me. And the next moment, a terrible scream was torn out of my lips as a burning pain seared into my thigh. I turned my head, forcing it to turn, and I saw that one of the creatures had buried something that looked like a flexible cable in my left thigh, and the pain was horrible. And even now, I remember that and much more with a shudder. But the agony did not end there, because the next thing that happened was that one of the creatures, a creature which looked very strange and unbelievably old, I noticed that its skin was peeling here and there, exposing a sort of a pinkish underlayer. There were peels of skin 
around the creature's mouth, near its left temple, and very close to where its ear should have been if it had been a human being. This creature pushed something into my nose, my right nostril, and there was a burst of pain that was so excruciating that I don't know whether I screamed or not. It was a maelstrom of agony. It was a storm of anguish. After that, my body just became numb. I could feel the creatures doing more painful things in parts of my body. They drained something from my organ of manhood, subjecting me to a deep feeling of horror, shame, and terror. And they did all this which, with a purposefulness that was almost blood chilly. And I remember screaming and crying out for my mother. And the, the creatures didn't care what I was saying. They took absolutely no notice of what I was, I was undergoing. To them, it was as if they were doing a job. Like surgeons dissecting an ugly monstrosity on some table. To them, it was a duty of some kind, a duty which was attended by a desperation and an efficiency that was literally out of this world. I remember, after what seemed like an eternity of hell and pain, I remember that the leading creature placed its hand upon my mouth, patting my open screaming lips again and again, none too gently, as if to say, please shut up, you stupid ape. Can't you see we are busy? There was, if I could have read only the sh a trace of expression or compassion in those cold, grayish blue alien faces, I would have, I would have understood. But their faces were totally unreadable and they said nothing. They only seemed to communicate with each other in a series of squeaks and rattling sound and hisses. I remember that in the group there was one of them which took my attention more than all the rest. This creature was wearing a grey silvery garment, but that was not all. It was also wearing a recognizable cap with a visor, a cap of the type that schoolboys used to wear in some schools, a round cap with a little peak like a duck's beak in front. I noticed this and it amazed me. What were these creatures? And when the taller, the tallest of the creatures finished petting my mouth, I assumed stupidly that my agony was over, but it was not. Because when human beings or strange creatures like those 
are busy torturing you. You are in extreme pain. Your pain knows no description. You cannot run. You are utterly kept, captive and helpless. And these things are doing to you exactly as they wish. But when they stop torturing you, when they stop plunging things into your body, things that you don't even understand, many times I wanted the creatures to tell me what they were torturing me for, what had I done. But they did not even say a word. They did not even make a single recognizable gesture of apology to me. They didn't. They just went about whatever they were doing. These creatures looked exactly like this. They are the type of alien creature that has been known and feared throughout Africa for generations. This creature is about three feet tall. It looks for all the world like a child who is on the last stages of dying of malnutrition. It looks exactly like this and it has a strange smell which once you smell it, you shall never forget it. This creature is known by the Zulu-speaking people of South Africa as a mantindane. The word mantindane comes from the verb ndinda, which means to abuse, to fiddle with, and to torture by interfering with the victim's genitals and other private parts. This is an exact description of the Mantindan. It does exactly that. For hundreds of years, even mighty nations such as the Zulus, even powerful warrior nations such as the Botswanas and Khozas lived in mortal fear of these creatures. Whenever a Zulu army went out on the warpath. Zulu warriors used to wear a strange cup-like device over their private parts under their loin skins. This cup-like device was very dangerous to a warrior in the heat of battle because it sometimes could get undone and get between the warrior's leg, thighs, and cause him to stumble and fall, and so to get killed by the enemy. But the Zulus were so afraid of having their seamen stolen by the Mantindane that they found this type of inconvenience acceptable, rather than that they should face the trauma of having things done to them by these beings. There is a huge tradition involving the Mandinda, the tormentors of the human race. But let me tell you this. Mandindanes are so real that you actually can eat one. And Zulus sometimes crack a joke when you have done a Zulu a very great favor the Zulu will sometimes say to you my friend I don't know how to thank you I should rather slaughter a Mandindane in your honor now that strange statement hides an actual practice which was is still being carried on in many parts of Southern Africa today. If a Sangoma finds a dead Mandindane in the bush, that Sangoma must invite his or her 
closest friends to a ritual feast on the dried flesh of this little monstrosity. And people who had have eaten the flesh of a Mandindan become inseparable friends afterwards. The creature's flesh is utterly tasteless. It tastes for all the world like, like soft cardboard to which a little salt has been added. And if you have ingested the creature's flesh, then you must prepare yourself for great sickness. A terrible rush will erupt all over your body. Your breathing will be hampered. Your heart will beat with great difficulty. And for a few hours or two or three days, you will suffer unbelievable agony with your skin itching, numb, and burning as if you have caught smallpox and you will come within inches of death itself an agonizing death and after that you will be overcome by an unbelievable ecstasy an ecstasy that no words of mine can describe My friends, there are very great mysteries in Africa and they are still there. They are still going on even as I speak to you. I will not dwell on this subject much longer, but let me tell you this, that after the Mandindane had finished torturing me, I assumed that my agony was at an end, but I was wrong because out of somewhere there came a very, very strange creature. A creature which shocked me all the more because it was amazingly human. The creature looked like a woman, a, a woman of very short stature. A woman with unnaturally golden hair, hair which looked as if it was made of fine metal wire. This woman had designs or tattoos of some kind on her forehead and on her chin and just below her neck. This woman looked like a white woman and this is what i found particularly frightening and i would rather not tell you what happened then let me accept this that it was a trauma that even now has never been expunged from my soul I was later to learn that this creature is the type of creature known by the Zulus as Ingupusan. The creature's features are strangely out of shape and ridiculous. Some types don't even have eyebrows above their heads, but the eyes are always piercingly blue. The eyes never blink for one moment. and. Although its hair is a metallic gold on its head, the hair in its armpits and other parts is a bright, shining, metallic red. I leave to your imagination to work out what this creature did to me. And please remember that those were the days in South Africa when apartheid was still ruling supreme. 
and I walked the valleys of South Africa afterwards, haunted by a double fear, the fear of the Mandindane and also the fear of being arrested by the police for having broken a strange law which was in force at that time. Let me tell you that after this strange, disproportionately shaped creature, a creature with an unnaturally long thorax and strangely short legs and long arms, I was forced off the table by the Mandindane and taken to see a number of things which even now make no sense to me. More than four decades ago, I saw creatures in what appeared to be glass jars, little mandindane swimming like ugly little frogs inside pinkish fluid. I saw other things that I cannot even pretend to understand or, or to describe. And then I saw in another place a number of people, yellow people, black people and white people, undergoing the same brutal torture that I had undergone. But then one of the people was a man. I came so close to him as to look down into his agonized face. He looked up at me and I looked up at him. The man was a white man. And some years, some years later, round about 1963, I was walking the streets of Johannesburg when a white man suddenly grabbed me by the shoulder. I thought I was being arrested. The white man said, hey, stop you. I stopped. He said, do you speak English? I said, yes, boss, I speak English. And then he said, where the fucking hell did I see you before? Where did I see you before? Where? I said, I don't know, boss. He said, listen, don't bullshit me, man. Where did I see you before? I said, I don't know. He said, were you in Rhodesia? I said, many times, boss. And then he looked at me for a long time, his lips trembling. It was obvious that the man was on the very brink of total insanity. There was a wild look in his gray eyes that chilled me to the core of my soul. His lower lip was trembling and there was spittle on it. And then he pushed me away. And as he walked away, he said, stupid Kefa, we were in hell together. Those words shall ring in my mind for as long as I live. Stupid Kefa, we were in hell together on the corner of Ilof and Marshall Street in the year of our Lord, 1963. The white man recognized me just as I recognized him. We were in hell together. It was one of the strangest events of my life, but many more were to follow. After, after I had been released 
from my strange imprisonment and torture. When I found myself back in the bush, I noticed two amazing things. One, that I was barefooted. I noticed two, that my clothes were back on my body again, but they were torn and dirty, and they smelt of the interior of the place in which the Mantindane had been torturing me. I remember that my brown trousers was severely torn at the knee and in over the left buttock. My khaki shirt was also torn, hanging almost in tatters from my body. I remember that I painfully made my way along a dusty path, hoping that it would lead me to a village or a kraal. I did not know who I was and where I had come from. My memory was a blank. And as I walked along that path, memory slowly returned. I was Credo Mutwa from South Africa. I was in the land called Rhodesia. And even as I walked painfully hobbling, I came in sight of a homestead, two rondavels, and a square building of mud. And as I approached the homestead, two dogs came at me like thunderbolts. One grabbed my left leg and tore my trousers with one bite of its jaws. I fell to the ground and feebly tried to fight off the dogs, but the animals appeared bent upon murdering me, and I did not wonder because I smelled strange. A strange alien smell hung over my entire body. I was gray and ashen, as if I had rolled in an ash heap for a number of days. I stank and I was very dirty. My identity documents were gone from my pocket and so were the keys that I, had, I always kept in my pocket. People came out to drive away the dogs and one of the people, a man, recognized me and he escorted me towards a distant village where he had seen me living. It was the home of my teacher, a, a, a lady of the Makaranga tribe. The man asked me where I had been. I said I did not know. The man told me that I had been missing for three days, if not more and that the tribal police had found my boots on the mountain slope, but the boots had not been unlaced. It was as if some force had sucked me out of both my boots and socks, leaving the footwear and the socks standing there in the felt. It was this that had shocked the denizens of the villages. When I returned to my teacher's home, once more every dog made for me. One actually gave me a painful bite on my right calf, on the calf of my right leg. And then, people ran away, some of them, at the sight of me. And it was only my teacher, Mrs. Moyo, who had the presence of mind to take me into one of her huts to have me bathed 
for over two hours in soap and warm water to remove the, the layers of dirt that now covered my body and also to remove the stench that hung over my whole person. I was smeared with brilliantine from head to foot in order to kill the awful alien odor that hung over me. And I got sick for two whole years, hovering on the brink of madness. Such was the trauma. After my horrible experience, I was to meet other people who had undergone similar experiences. Black men and black women who had been through hell and back and who carried marks as proof of their awesome experience, who carried injuries to testify that the words they were talking were true. Women got mysteriously impregnated and then mysteriously aborted also. People were captured again and again and yet again. And in me also, storms were brewing. It appeared as if these Mandindane creatures were bent upon following me through wherever I went. I could say more, but I leave that for others to tell when I'm gone from this earth. But let me tell you this, that there is no glory, there is no glamour, there is no sanctity in being captured and tortured by a mantindane. People who say that these creatures speak to a, their victims telepathically are telling cheap lies. These creatures do not talk to you. Strange pictures are instilled into your mind. Pictures of the end of the world. Pictures of seas polluted almost to an inky blackness where not a fish nor a bird is to be seen. Pictures of a landscape turned dry and dead with the trees forever frozen, leafless and dead on a landscape which is as hard as granite. Pictures of poisonous dark yellow clouds swimming across the blue and poisoned skies. Pictures of mountains denuded of all life. Pictures of dust swelling where green things bloomed centuries before. When you have been captured by the Mandinda, you want to find out exactly why this happened to you. As a traditional African, I am taught to accept this, to only know that for some reason I had been chosen by these godlike creatures for some kind of sacrifice, but I refuse to accept this. And so I went from people to people, from group to group, trying to find comfort, hoping to find sense out of something that really made no sense. And then one day, I was fortunate enough to correspond with a white lady called Elizabeth Clara, who went a long way in trying to make me understand what had happened to me. But my mind was still not satisfied. And it still is not satisfied. I want to know the reason behind the things that the Mandindanes do. I am not one of those who believes that these Mandindanes are experimenting with us. There is too much purposefulness, 
too much efficiency behind the whole thing. These creatures are harvesting us for some reason. And they are harvesting not only human beings, but also animals as well. Because they often mo molest and mutilate animals in the African bush. And each animal that has been molested by and killed by the Mandindane is known by a number of facts. One. The animal never rots in the bush as it lies dead. It simply dries up as hard as a board. The many scavengers, the crows, the vultures, and other carnivores that devour dead things in the African bush never touch an animal, whether wild or domestic, which has been killed by the Mandinda. They never do. And if you observe the carcass of such an animal on a dark and moonless night, you will notice that in many parts of, of it, there is a strange eerie glow, clearly recognizable in the starlight. What it all means, I do not know. All I do know is that somewhere out there, there are creatures of an extremely high intelligence, creatures that have haunted the lives of our remote ancestors for hundreds, if not thousands of years, creatures that still haunt our lives at this day and this hour. My friends, as a result of several years of experience, I would like to advance this argument. The Mandindane creatures do not come from any star or star system in space. I say that these creatures come from our future. Why do I say so? Because this creature arrives on Earth completely protected by a helmet and a suit of what looks like metal, flexible metal of some kind. The creature's hands, feet and head are completely protected against our Earth's atmosphere. So is the Ngadlangadla here. It is completely sheathed in heavy metal. But with the Mandindan, the story is different. Mandindanes have been seen out in the open many times. Their heads completely bare and their, their hands bare to the wrist, completely unprotected by any material or metal whatsoever. These creatures walk through our world as if they own it. A world in which there are so many poisonous substances. You will find Mandindanes bareheaded, their hands completely uncovered in a world where logically they should be covered from head to foot. These creatures, furthermore, are capable of impregnating earth women. They seek fluids and flesh from us human beings. If these creatures were a, a species of creatures from some far planet, they wouldn't do that. 
they wouldn't be able to impregnate our women. They wouldn't be able to, to, to do what they are doing to us. These are our descendants. And when you have been worked over by them, you will understand that what they are doing to you, they do it with angry consciences. They are taking revenge upon us for what we have done to our future a few thousand years from now. And I am firmly convinced of this and all things that have happened to me since that terrible day have served to confirm that these are our descendants, not aliens from some far galaxy, no. Now, one last thing let me tell you. There is a race of alien creature to which the Nupusana creature belongs. A race of creatures who are tall with metallic golden hair and bright blue eyes. These creatures are often seen in Africa. They are known all the way from the Congo Republic right down to Siskai in South Africa. And black people of, of many tribes call these creatures by a strange name, a name by which they have known them for hundreds of years, the name Watende, Walende, or Wazungu or Walungu or Balungu. Now, when Africans met white people from Europe, they transferred to the white people the name by which they had known these blonde-headed, blue-eyed extraterrestrials. The name was Zungu, Watende, Walende, and Balungu, or Belungu. Now, what does the name Watende mean? It means the people of the whirlwind. So does the word Mzungu which is used by many tribes in Zimbabwe and elsewhere to refer to white people. So does the Zulu word Mlungu or Umlungu. It means the righteous one of the whirlwind. Why? Because when a ship, a spacecraft belonging to these beings descends upon Earth, it does so at a fast spiraling rate and as a result of this spiraling it causes a whirlwind to form which often damages African hearts. <laughs> so you see the black people first became acquainted with extraterrestrial white men and women before they met the real article. And what a meeting it was, very explosive, as any history book will tell you. Thank you.